okay, so uh, my job is, is to just uh, give some, uh, some thoughts to summarize <clears throat> the, the field or the state of AI today and, and, and be more speculative. So uh, there have been, I, I don't know how many people know about these books. So the one on the left, so that's a very popular one, Life 3.0. How many know the one on the right? Hardly anybody knows that one. So this is, uh, you know, the rock star professor, Mark, Max Tegmark. You can see leather jacket and rock star looks, and he became the Amazon bestseller list. But poor Toby Walsh, who is a boring academic like us, uh, nobody knows about his book. Uh, so, uh, but today's talk, I mean, I'm not going to talk about these books. So, sorry to disappoint you if that uh, title of my talk misled you. If you're interested in talking about this, I, I've written a review of these books and I can, I'm happy to share them with you and we can have the discussion later. Uh, but uh, the reason to, uh, to put it up here in this talk is just to use the perspective. So, Max Tegmark, uh, is, for those of you who know him, he's a cosmologist. So, as a cosmologist, he, he likes to think of I mean, what's a small amount of time for him? One million years or one billion years is really when you uh, start talking for real. So in, in his book, he talks about what AI will do in one million years from now. <clears throat> and uh, 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 the boring guy on the other hand, he talks about what will happen in the next 20 to 50 years. So when I talk about what is the future of AI, I'm really talking on the 20 to 50 year spectrum. I really don't know what will happen in one million or one billion years. So that was, uh, you know, we, uh, Mark told us that the pedigree for AI and so on comes from Alan Turing. And then uh, the, the term itself was invented by Joseph McCarthy, but the kind of AI he did, good old-fashioned AI, is not what we do today. So <clears throat> what are, I mean, we heard from the talks today earlier that, uh, you know, just listening to Rickard previously, that we, there have been some very uh, impressive advances in practical technologies to do AI like Google Translate, uh, but, but that system really doesn't understand AI, so <clears throat> that's very far away from understanding language. And we also heard from Frederick about uh, that low-hanging fruits have been solved, but there are bigger <clears throat> problems of understanding uh, the real world uh, through visual perception that have not been solved. So the que <clears throat> there's a long way to go before we really solve the big problems of AI, and uh, recently, there have been three position papers written by three different groups about talking about these kinds of roadmaps to AI. So those of you who are interested in that, I recommend uh, reading these papers. So the first one is really long and has a lot of commentary from other people. And by, it's a bunch of people from MIT and NYU. Then the second paper is from, uh, from Angeliki's lab about neuroscience and AI, and the third one is, again, it's Angeliki's uh, PhD advisor uh, writing uh, and, and, and some of his colleagues from Facebook research. Uh, so they all make for interesting reading about the, <clears throat> uh, they're, they're all taking a perspective of uh, not one million, one billion years, but 20, 50 years, where is AI going and what are the key uh, areas to, to move in. So, uh, <clears throat> so here is my very short summary, which is not fully accurate representation of what they say, but here are some key components that we need to work on to, towards this problem of, of uh, gen, you know, uh, solving the big problems of AI. And some of them we heard about today, vision, perception, this, this is the, what Frederick was talking about, natural language, uh, Rickard and Angeliki were talking about, and uh, uh, the MIT group, for example, they uh, stress intuitive physics. That, you know, when Kids, babies, they already know a lot of intuitive physics, and that's somehow important for, for learning about the world. And there are other things, but uh, the two I highlighted there uh, are because that's related to what I'm going to talk about next, and that first one there is learning by communication and interaction, and that was the stage set by Angeliki, that was her paradigm. <coughs> and um, also related to that is that there should be closer connection to cognitive science and, and neuroscience. So <clears throat> I believe that these two things are definitely going to be important. And um, uh, here is a, uh, so uh, <clears throat> as I said, and Rickard also mentioned, some of us here at Chalmers have been inspired by this paradigm that Angeliki and her collaborators have, de have developed with this multi-agent communication. <clears throat> and so we've been applying it recently to a, 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 a problem in cognitive science <clears throat> which is quite well known. So let's see if this comes up. 
If I showed you this paint chip and asked you to tell me what color it is, what would you say? How about this one? And this one? You probably said blue, purple, and brown. But if your native language is Wobe from Côte d'Ivoire, you probably would have used one word for all three. That's because not all languages have the same number of basic color categories. In English, we have 11. Russian has 12. But some languages like Wobe only have three. And researchers have found that if a language only has three or four basic colors, they can usually predict what those will be. So how do they do it? As you would expect, different languages have different words for colors. But what interests researchers isn't those simple translations. It's the question of which colors get names at all. Because as much as we think of colors in categories, the truth is that color is a spectrum. It's not obvious why we should have a basic color term for this color, but not this one. And until the 1960s, it was widely believed by anthropologists that cultures would just choose from the spectrum randomly. But in 1969, two Berkeley researchers, Paul Kay and Brent Berlin, published a book challenging that assumption. They had asked 20 people who spoke different languages to look at these 330 color chips and categorize each of them by their basic color term. And they found hints of a universal pattern. If a language had six basic color words, they were always for black or dark, white or light, red, green, yellow, and blue. If it had four terms, they were for black, white, red, and then either green or yellow. If it had only three, they were always for black, white, and red. It suggested that as languages develop, they create color names in a certain order. First black and Okay, so that's an interesting video to watch for those of you who want to do it. But so this idea was, it's a simple question that was asked by cognitive science researchers. Names for colors in different languages. Is there anything universal? Are there, is there anything universal about color names? And so they, uh, these two researchers that they mentioned in that uh, clip, they carried out uh, this thing called the World Color Survey, and they collected data from different language speakers. And <clears throat> so the, the one on the top shows this experimental um, uh, um, tile set that is used in these experiments, and the one at the bottom shows a typical result. So this is a result from a, a language which has one, two, three, <coughs> uh, so three color categories. And this is the way they labeled those colors in the tiles. So they used these color names for those. <coughs> so the question is, you know, uh, is there something universal about these color names? As we see, different languages have different number of color terms, <coughs> but um, is and despite these differences, is there anything universal? And does that tell you something about the cognitive processes? <clears throat> so um, uh, an influential way of thinking about this from cognitive scientists is to think of language as informative communication. <clears throat> so it's uh, something that you measure how inf informative the system is for communicating versus how efficient it is for communicating. Uh, so. So you can make it even more precise, and you can relate it to very classic uh, uh, concepts from information theory. So this is the Shannon theory of information um, uh, communication over a noisy channel. So, <clears throat> so here is now this, this, this question framed in this setting that in this paradigm that Angeliki was talking about. So there is a, <clears throat> an agent, the sender, who has a particular color in mind, say that blue color represented by T. <clears throat> so his distribution is concentrated on that color. And he has to convey that color to the uh, other agent, to, to the other person. And he does that by using a color term, such as blue. So he's communicating using natural language. And now the sender, once he receives this, he has to reconstruct what that color is based just on what he received uh, with the linguistic communication, the language, the, the word. And you can measure how successful this is by the reconstruction error. And that's the formula at the bottom. So this is a way you can quantify how useful uh, a system of color, color names, color terms is for language as a way of communicating between two, uh, two agents. Uh, and uh, uh, this is a result of what they did when they applied it to these real uh, languages from around the world. So and the cognitive scientists, uh, they study this question by the picture on the left. So what they do is they actually go to these remote 
uh, places where the, these languages are spoke, spoken, they, they, they gather a few people to carry these experiments, they show them the, the tile set, and they actually carry, this carry out this experiment of uh, one person communicating with the other person, and they record what happens, and so on. So that's the picture on the left. That's how cognitive scientists have been studying this question. And as you can imagine, this, this is going to be its slow, it's tedious, you have to gather these subjects, explain the game to them, Usually they think that this is a bunch of really crazy uh, Western white people who come there and ask these stupid questions. So it's very hard to even motivate why you should do this, and the results are unreliable and obviously a very small sample size. So the idea that we had is, well, why don't we do it with the picture on the right, <coughs> where you don't have people, you have <coughs> two agents. And these are computers, two automated agents, as in Angeliki's talk, and they're going to communicate and, and then see what happens to the language, the color terms that they develop through this interaction. So this is what we, we this is a work uh, done by Mikhail uh, Kogebeka, a PhD student in our group who's in there, and, and Asad Said, who's somewhere there as well, somewhere at the back from CLASP, which is uh, another center for language uh, research in Gothenburg University. So what we did here was <coughs> we modeled those two agents as deep neural networks, as in Angeliki's talk, and then we uh, played essentially this, this game. So one of the agents will send a color term to the other agent, and the other agent will try to reconstruct what this color was. And, and the, the, this, um, these two agents are trained using reinforcement learning that we mentioned earlier, and some of you might know it from these famous examples from DeepMind, playing Atari games and and, and, the, and the, the spectacular Go <coughs> demonstration. So we used a simple version of that <coughs> reinforcement learning technique to train it <coughs> in these, uh, to play this game. And here is a, a sample example of, of, of this work. So the, the picture on the, on the top is from a real language using uh, five colors. <coughs> and the one at the bottom is what is <coughs> what happens as a result of this communication, what is learned by these agents. So the agents learn a language to communicate, to play this game of, of communicating a, a color, and, and the, the, <coughs> the one at the bottom shows what happens when the agents do it. So what we have seen is that, that there's a pretty close correspondence between the real language and the one that these agents develop. And so <coughs> in, in terms of these measures of information uh, efficiency, what you learn playing this reinforcement learning <coughs> game gives you <coughs> a way of communicating which has both high information content and, 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 and um, high information efficiency. So this is a picture showing that uh, <coughs> the, 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 the information efficiency as measured by information surprise, <coughs> that it goes down with the number of colors <coughs> as you increase this category. So uh, the short um, <coughs> uh, thing to take in mind um, uh, from this is that this was for, for us an example, or for me an example of how AI should relate to, so AI is on the left and cognitive science and neuroscience on the right. And I think there should be a lot more interaction be between these two fields than we've had so far. There has been, of course, I mean, the whole area of neural networks is inspired by, by, by real uh, net, you know, neural ne uh, uh, networks in the brain, but the analogy is a bit weak. I mean, there's inspiration, but the correspondence is very weak. <clears throat> so I think that these two fields should have a much closer interaction with each other and in both directions. So in the first direction, that's using machine learning and AI techniques to investigate neuroscience and <coughs> cognitive science. Uh, that was one of the uh, simple examples was what we did here to try to understand this color naming as a the cognitive science question using uh, simple reinforcement learning models, <coughs> or <coughs> you know, things like uh, what, what people are trying to do in the Human Brain pro Project. You generate a lot of, now, now, now there's a lot of data being produced by fMRI scans and so on, which reveal lots of information about the brain. And you should <coughs> you know, use machine learning and AI techniques to understand <coughs> the, uh, the processes in the brain using those techniques. That's the, the interaction in one direction. On the other hand, the interaction the other direction should allow us to build better models for, for, for machine learning and AI systems. <clears throat> for example, one of the examples here is reinforcement learning. It's well known that 
that reinforcement learning has a biological basis in, in, in the brain. So there, is, there are uh, <coughs> systems of uh, signaling in the brain you, involving, for example, dopamine that do, <coughs> that, that is a process of re implement some kind of reinforcement learning mechanism. So perhaps we can learn better ways of doing reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is, is a very uh, hotly studied subject today, but it's well known that there are many limitations. It needs very large sample complexity. It's, it's not uh, really very well uh, done in a hierarchical fashion. So there should be better ways to do reinforcement learning, and perhaps this direction in the, in the, the bottom direction is a way we can learn better ways of doing reinforcement learning and more generally, better models of uh, machine learning and AI. So, I <clears throat> so that was my uh, short uh, take-home reflection of one of the elements in this uh, AI roadmap, that there should be much closer interaction between these two <coughs> uh, directions. And I'll, co I'll end with this co quote from uh, one of the pioneers of uh, AI and cognitive science uh, <coughs> and economics, Herbert Simon. So he says here that when you're, uh, when you're using your AI and ML to see what, not only what they can accomplish, but how you accomplish it, then you're really doing cognitive science. You're using AI to understand the human mind. So he was uh, saying this a long time ago. Uh, <clears throat> among other things, he was a pioneer in this. So let's uh, end with this thought for this session on machine intelligence. Thanks a lot.